So we're going to come back to that in a second. For those of you who are not 100% sure who uh, Professor Nick Benadel is, uh, he, he is the founder of uh, the Gordon Institute of Science. It's, it's Gibbs, known as Gibbs. It was established in the year 2000. He initially was in a career in, uh, with Barlow Rand Group. He was in sales and general management. He then got into the educational world. He was the dean at the Witz Business School for many years. And then he left and started a business. He was in a very high position, obviously, the, the highest you can get at Witz Business School, and decided to leave it all and start something new. And that something new, being Gibbs, was ranked in the top 40 uh, globally in executive education providers. To go from nothing to be top 40 in the world is unbelievable. Uh, Prof. Benadel is a, a traveler and explorer. Obviously, a lot of that's been put on hold. I know he traveled quite a bit within South Africa before. Maybe he's doing a little bit more of that. He's, uh, and in fact, it was in his blood. By the age of six, he had lived in, sorry, by the age of 10, he had lived in six different countries. Uh, and some diverse countries, as Zimbabwe, Germany, Yemen, Kenya, South Africa, Britain. And then he studied in the United States um, and spent five years there. His area of expertise is strategy, and he still consults in strategy. So for us uh, within ORT, I think we're going to focus a lot on that strategy aspect. Just from his educational point of view, even educationally, he's traveled. So he started off at his BCom at Rhodes University. Instead of going to the same university, he went to Cape Town, did his MBA. Instead of staying in the same country, he actually went to the USA and went to the University of Washington to do his PhD. So the way we're going to work this today is we're going to focus on three different things. We're first going to start off, and Nick, you're going to tell us just a little bit about yourself. Uh, and we'll do it fairly briefly, kind of where you where you came from, how you got into being in education, and then we'll come back to that at the end. But the, the heart of it is going to be part two, which will be the strategy. Understanding what is strategy and how do we make strategic decisions, both from a business point of view and maybe for the audience, a smaller business and individually. How do we know if we're making our decisions from a strategic point of view? And then we'll go through any advice that you have. The world has changed, I think. Will it go back to what it was? I don't know. Should it go back to what it was? And I'd like your opinion on kind of the advice that you would give to a 20-year-old, a 40-year-old, and maybe a 60-year-old. And Nick, I look at your surname, Benadel. And if I break it out, Bena in Afrikaans means in. Del as we know, is a computer. So I want to pick your computer brain, getting to the brain of the, the, the Dell, the computer. And uh, if you can just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you built up and started Gibbs, and then we can move into the strategy. That's lovely, David. Thanks so much again for inviting me and good morning, everybody. Uh, where I am, I'm in Cape Town at the moment. It's a beautiful day. And I hope Joburg's having a lovely, normal, crisp winter day or wherever else you happen to be. Um, David, I, I love the way you use my name. Um, it is one way of looking at it. It's actually a French and German name. Um, my family came here 150 years ago. But um, in French, it's bien, which means good. And uh, edel means high. So uh, it, it, I often get, when I was lecturing in Saudi, uh, I managed to make it uh, Arabic. <laughs> so so uh, <laughs> there was a way of doing that. Anyway, it's so uh, lovely. Thanks for that. That's fun. So um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be with you. And um, maybe we'll talk at the end a bit about, about the journey that I've followed. Because for all of us, as we, as we make our way forward, we need two very powerful things that can work in tandem. And I've come to abbreviate them as being the map and the mirror. 
The mirror is why you're in the room. And for leaders and entrepreneurs especially, because it's kind of lonely in a sense, because you're holding the thing together, um, you must as fast as you can develop an answer to why. And, and there are many reasons for that. The primary one is the energy has to come from you. So you better know why you're doing it. You better be able to look in the mirror and know how you've got into the room, what's been your life's journey so far, and what you've brought with you, and the why you prepared to do this remarkably important thing, which is create something new that is going to be successful. And because that energy is a sort of voluntary energy, it comes from within. And uh, we'll talk a bit more about that later, perhaps. Um, and David, feel free to stop me and, and ask questions at any time. Right. And the other is the map, the mirror and the map. The map is where are you? And, and how, what was your journey to get there? You know, where have you come from? And then where are you going? And we use maps these days, Google Maps, because we plug in a destination. So you set a goal. I want to build a business that's like this or this big or in this sector or this product. And then you've got to navigate your way to try and get there, knowing that there are many routes. Sometimes they're off ramps. Sometimes we get off the main road, but we're always mindful of where we're trying to get to. As Alice in Wonderland said, if you don't know where you're going, any route will get you there. And so you want to avoid that because you want to have a vision and outcome that is an end goal. If I, <clears throat> excuse me, if I said to you, you've got to drive between Joburg and Cape Town, and most of you have done it. I've done it multiple times. I don't need a map to make that journey. It's 1,400 kilometers. It's going to take you about 12 or 14 hours. And uh, you don't need a map, really. So uh, once you're on the road, you're on your way. And if we left now at quarter to 10, uh, you'd get here this evening where I am in Cape Town, or I'd get to where you are in Joburg. It's pretty straightforward. It might be a bit demanding to get in a car and drive for 14 hours, but it's doable. If I said to you, you've got to go to Nairobi, it might be slightly different. Uh, the first thing most people suddenly start to think about is, Okay, how do I get to Nairobi? If you have to drive, where would you go? And what's the route? And there are many routes I won't you know, entertain you with thinking that through and disappointing your geography teacher. But there is a road and uh, you don't need visas and uh, it's tarred almost all the way, if not all the way. And it's only two Jobergs to Cape Town. It's two and a bit more, it's 4,000 kilometers. And it's quite doable. And many people do it, but we haven't. Most of you, maybe somebody has. If I said you've got to drive to Marrakesh, then you'd really have to think hard about that. And that's a story you'd tell your grandchildren. So I like to think about, you know, what lies ahead and how we think about it in terms of ordinary journeys, the day to day, the week to week, the operations of the business, delivering quality, dealing with issues, motivating yourself and others as the drive to Cape Town. It's not that big a deal. It can be done. Nairobi is a bit more of an adventure, but it's very doable. And Marrakesh, that's going to be a great mission. So when I think of the Amazons and the Elon Musks and the Henry Fords and the, the great, you know, the Adrian Gore, these, these pioneers, they did the Marrakesh. They did beyond Marrakesh. And they've done it for 40 years. And they've kept doing it. And they've kept reinventing themselves, which is a remarkable achievement. Whereas Musk is a, just a great visionary. He's, he's a pioneering visionary across sectors, which is very unusual. So, so you want to... If yeah, I can stop you there, how, how do you know if you should be aiming for Joburg, uh, if you should be aiming for uh, Nairobi, if you should be aiming for Marrakesh? How, how do you let's, know if it's let's, uh, too much... Let's, let's start in Cape Town because that keeps us going north. Um, right. And so, you know, you get on with the drive to Joburg and you do it well and you do it a few times and you learn to get the confidence. Then maybe you say, I've got to get to Nairobi and there are new markets and new customers and new products. And then maybe you say, I'm going to do something really different. 
because in the field of strategy, let me, let me turn this now. So uh, simply put, what I'm saying is you need a map. And if you don't set an end destination, then you'll never put the information on the map that you need for the journey that you have. And, and for most entrepreneurs, that's what are you really good at? Well, have, you got a, have you got a product or service that's got some unique element? Think of Robbie Brosen and Nando's. Um, do you really understand the product? Uh, what value add do you make to the product as a business? Uh, do you really understand your customers and their changing needs? Do you understand your non-customers? How well do you understand your rivals if you have, have a rival or rivals? Those are fundamental questions we'll come back to. But that's the information you put on your map. There's another set of information, which is most entrepreneurs struggle to build the organization. We've got a great idea, but we've got to get the resources, financial and otherwise, and we've got to start putting the systems in and the structures in. And that's a, a, a similar thing, but a different kind of map. So yeah, let me, let me say that about the journey, that I deeply admire people who make these kinds of journeys. I've done it a few times in my life. Maybe we'll talk about that later. But making a journey. One of my favorite sources of inspiration is a man called Joseph Campbell. You'll battle to find his material, but you will. He was the guy who wrote the script for all the Star Wars, the meta script, not the, not the dialogue, but the, the big script of technology and man, um, uh, father and son, uh, going into space, adventure. And uh, books have been written using his basic framework because he wasn't a movie guy. He was a comparative anthropologist. In other words, he studied all cultures. And what he wrote about is all cultures require people to go on a journey, an adventure. And at some point in your life, there'll be the knock on the door, the adventure calls you to take a risk. Most people duck the adventure and live unordinary lives. But some people are prepared to take on the adventure. And the hero's journey, as he calls it, is what happens in that journey to the unknown. Because building any business, as I know from starting Gibbs with a scrap of paper and no money and no campus, is a journey into the unknown. And some people have it in them and some people don't. Um, and Campbell's story is about every, every person to become fulfilled in life must go down the journey into the unknown. I like to say that even at an individual level and at a business level and at a country level, the future is history waiting to happen that we are who we are psychologically already. Your habits, your nature, your work rate, your creativity are pretty well established. So you are history waiting to happen. And the future is history waiting to happen, except there are two things, either something you do or something that happens to you. So life is something that happens to you. These are the people who react to life. They never go on the adventure. Or life is something they do. They impose their will. They impose their ideas. They share their thoughts and they go on the journey. And that's why I like Campbell so much because like so many writers, he's inviting you to go on a journey. And in fact, nine out of 10 American films uh, use exact very American thing, this sort of hero's journey. So let me, let me talk a bit about strategy for a minute, David, and then, then I'll stop. So strategy is about differentiation. It's about uniqueness. It's about energy. It's about speed. It's about creativity. But mainly it's about starting with the customer or the need in mind. Many entrepreneurs fall in love with their mousetrap Sometimes it's a better mousetrap, sometimes it's not. But good strategy always starts out with a very simple question. To those people who are my markets, 
what do they really need? Not just what do they want, what do they need? I look at things like social media, or when I was a younger person, the arrival of CNN, or how Henry Ford made mass transportation cost-effective through mass production, or Bill Gates made software ubiquitous, or Elon Musk with his battery-driven cars. All of these are people who had a great intellect and creativity and then said, well, what do people actually need that I can deliver to them? It all starts outside the business. So that's the first point. Secondly, it is about differentiation. We find the same thing in nature amongst plant life, amongst animals, the survival of a species depends on being differentiated and being right for the environment. You must be the time, right for the time you're in. And I'm gonna talk about COVID in a minute. You can't be the right for the time you came from, which is easy. You know, that's the annuity business. We did this long time ago. It's why Stutterfords died. It's that they kept doing what they'd always done and were unable to change. IBM nearly died for that same reason. Countries disappear because they keep on doing what they've always done in a world full of very, very rapid change. The third thing I want to emphasize is energy, especially in small businesses. The founder, the entrepreneur is the source of code, the source of energy. And actually a lot of them don't grow because they think they're the only energy. But in the beginning, they often are. And the mature executive knows when they're starting to transfer that energy or that skill to others, so you develop a system and a culture and a structure that goes beyond the founder. And if I, I, if I think in South Africa of Adrian Gore, I just take my hat off to him. Uh, he's an extraordinary man because he's built, you know, Brian Joffe was similar. He built a system which goes beyond the founder. So we'll come back to that. <clears throat> the, the other aspect I want to raise is that all strategy is about power. It's taken me a long time to really understand this. There are different kinds of power, but power is really important to understand. And, you know, in accounting, we call it the assets, but accounting is such a narrow field. You've got to think about this very holistically. All these things I'm talking about are very holistic. And so the question is a good idea that is not got resources or energy or power behind it isn't going to go anywhere. So what does the product actually do? That is the product's power. In what way does it add value to people's lives? That's the product's power. The business's power is how's this business organized and led in a way that gives it authority, that gives it reputation. And normally it's because the product or the service adds value to people's lives. And when that happens, you'll make a lot of money. If you serve people by adding value to their lives in a, in a smart way, that's right for them, then, uh, then you really are in good shape. So let me stop there. And let me say humans are intensely competitive and cooperative. Strategy can be about cooperating, but it's also about competing. And in business, in capitalism, we argue it's mainly about competing. You've got to have a product that's different than the other person, meeting a real need. That's what strategy is about. So let me stop there, David, and see where you'd like to go. Great. Fantastic. So um, what I'm going to do at the end of the talk, we'll open it up for anybody who wants to ask questions. But in the meantime, if you have a question as Nick is talking, please put your questions down in the chat, uh, in the chat group, and uh, I'll ask it from there. So, Nick, when you look at your product and you've got an idea for something, yeah. how do you know if it's got that power? How do you assess? if it's something that the market really wants, or it's just you who thinks that's what the market wants. And then once you get that, where do you get that, the source and the funding and all that stuff to start something like that? How do you, how do you know how much of your guts you're going to put into it? Or, or does it, is it not a question? Does it just flow from you? 
When, when I started Gibbs, as you mentioned, I'd been at the Wits Business School. I was actually there for 13 years, six years as the head of the school. And uh, I decided to leave. I decided to step down. And then I got found and asked if I would be interested in starting another business school. And I thought about it for quite a long time because I knew this would be the, a big phase of my career. And I got a few other offers to go and work in companies again and so on. And I made this choice because I love education. And I've been very privileged to do something that's given me great joy for 40 years. I've never considered what I do work. You know, in my corporate life, I had a job. I had to work. In 90% in in of my career, I've done what my passion is about. I've never considered it work. Doesn't mean I don't get tired, but the, but the motivation is natural. So how do we know if something works? And when I started the school, I took a piece of paper and wrote down a few things and, and we just started. You, you just got to start the journey. You know, that's Campbell's message, start the journey. Don't agonize. So a great quote that a friend gave me about the country, uh, which maybe we'll come back to later if there's time, is don't agonize, organize. And I love that. Don't spend your whole life wondering, is it okay? Can it be done? Think a lot, but start the journey because life, the market will reveal to you if what you're doing is right. And if you're looking at it from the customer's point of view, then they will tell you. Don't throw it over the wall. Live in the joy of use of your product. Be sure you really understand how your service or product is being used. Robbie Bros and I were, uh, have been good mates for many decades. And uh, when I first met Robbie, I got to know his personality. And one day I said to him, Robbie, you are a chicken. I mean, he totally lives that product in the peak of his career. You must be your product. It's a very important thing. If you think of it as a way to make money, you'll come third. If you think of the product as something really just a thing you do, it's a dungus, you know, it's a thing, you won't do well. If your soul believes in it, and if it comes out of something that you know about, then you'll have a shot at success. Now, there's a practical dimension to this. I love engineers. I want to marry and have lots of children with multiple engineers because engineers do stuff. They make stuff. And ultimately, there's a practical test the best analogy I can give you is, um, is keys and locks. I'm sure you can all get into your minds a, a Yale lock and a key. And if you've got a bunch of keys and one lock, that key has to fit that lock. I don't know if you've ever thought about how a lock actually works. It's like thinking about a watch. How does a lock actually work? You put the key in and you turn it and the lock opens, but how does it open? What causes it to lock? And only one person I've ever asked this question to actually answered it correctly, because I, of course, cheated and went online to find out how is the lock designed. But what happens is the ridges go in, and then there are certain uh, pistons, little uh, um, pistons and springs, and as it matches, it turns them, and then it springs open with the spring. So think about that. We've used Yale locks for many, many years. And then somebody, when I was a kid, gave me a combination lock. Now there's no more key. So the basic design has changed, and I have to remember the numbers. Twist, 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 and then it opens. Well, also with a spring. Huh, slight change. Not a big change, but a slight change. And then one day I pitched up somewhere, and there was a keypad. And I had to punch in some numbers. And then the door opened electronically. So it was mechanical and electronic, and the door opened. And then I, I uh, saw at a company about 10 years ago, now a thumbprint. I had to put my thumb onto this little photoelectric cell. I'd stored my thumbprint on it, and as I put my thumb on it, the door opened. And when I arrived at an airport a couple of years ago, the guy came advancing on me with one of those, like we've got COVID devices, and he looked into my eye, and that led me into the country because he took a shot of my iris and every eyeball is different, like a fingerprint. Now, if you think about them, they're all doing the same thing, but they're doing it in constantly changing formats. And that's the practicality we have to understand. And it's often the engineers, the fiddlers like Henry Ford. He was a tinkerer. 
He constantly played with stuff. Donny Gordon constantly played with ideas of financial service products. You want to keep doing that. Mm. So that's the practical thing, that the locks play the same role, but their form has changed totally. Same function, different form. And so social media has replaced a lot of media, right? Zoom has replaced meeting people. These are natural things that happen to us all the time. This is the journey of life. Nick, it's interesting you talk about uh, the engineers because I'm sure there's a there's a metric I'm sure you've heard of where uh, you take the number of engineers in a con- in a country and divide it by the number of lawyers. And yeah. if that number is bigger than one, the com- the country is growing. Otherwise, it's becoming very litigious. In America, unfortunately, the number of lawyers is much greater than the number of engineers. <laughs> yeah, I've heard of that ratio. So I go to China or India and I see the number of engineers, especially software engineers in India, and it just totally blows your mind away. Every small town in India has an institute of technology in which young people learn coding. We don't. Yeah. And yeah, I think that shows the focus. We buy it. So the algorithm, if you think about just, I mean, this is just kind of fun. If you think about inventing a business today, I mean, we live in a world of algorithms. And if you don't know what an algorithm is and you can't code, you can't develop the product. So you're going to have to hire some bright 21-year-old to do that for you. And I'm mm-hmm. totally out of my depth. You know, someone said to me the other day, I'm learning Python. Well, I grew up in Kenya and I once stepped over a Python. That's about as close as I've got to Python as code. So if you don't have the skill, which very often we don't, you have to bring it in. And I did that when I started Gibbs. I brought in people who knew more about something than I did, but who I could communicate with and, and work with. So, yeah, I, you know, it, it, this, the world does not need your permission to change. An astonishing discovery for our ego. The world mm. changes without our permission. And what the smarts are about is understanding how it's changing and why it's changing and what that change means for me. Mm. So I actually want to go to a question that relates to that in the, in the chat. Uh, Brent, uh, Brett Spilkin asked a question, what will tertiary education look like in 10 to 15 years? Will there be a Harvard degree for the masses online? And what will happen to the exclusivity of the Ivy League organizations when so, education is democratized or decentralized? That's an interesting question, uh, Brent. Let me say firstly that uh, something that might surprise you. I, I did a doctorate and a master's and a BCom and I've studied. Uh, that is maybe a quarter of my knowledge of, of, of knowledge. Knowledge is what we call tacit. It's in the fingers. It's in the mind. We get it mainly from our experience and from our personality. So all that schooling is, is a, a coding of knowledge. It's a structure. I hated school. I didn't do well at school. I was not intrigued by school at all. I barely passed. It didn't motivate me. When I did my MBA, I got very motivated. And then I did well. So most of life's learning is self-driven. And that's one of the tragedies is if I get a degree, I must be qualified. Absolute rubbish. If you get a degree, you may have a lot of information. You may have bugger all knowledge and you may have even less energy. So most learning is experiential on the journey of life I was referring to. How does this change? Uh, How's education going to change? Well, of course, we've massified it now. So this brilliant technology allows me to go on YouTube at night and listen to the best lecturers in the world on any subject I like. And let me encourage you to do this, especially on things that are irrelevant. Let me explain why. You've got a master finance and accounting and your products and your industry, and you've got to do all of that, right? <clears throat> Have you ever noticed that for most of you, if you've worked in a big company, that the meeting is the least creative thing possible? In fact, no good ideas ever happen at work. Even for most of us, our best ideas are in the shower, on holiday, when we're traveling, when we're comparing something. <clears throat> it's because we design work so badly. So learning has got to be self-learning. I don't mean understanding only yourself, but you must have a study program. And every top CEO I know has a study program. What's the problem you're trying to solve and where can you learn about the problem? And 99% of what we're trying to learn, someone else has figured out before. 
So spend at least 10% of your time studying. I, I can't emphasize this enough. I don't mean doing courses, although that's great. I mean studying. Peter Drucker wrote about 70 books on management. He's probably the most revered management guru. And uh, he, he, he had a habit. From the age of 25, he spent 10% of his time every year studying one subject. And these were bizarre subjects, Japanese flower arranging, Chinese um, iron ore production the history of Belgium. I mean, they were bizarre topics, but he would study this topic. And by the end of the year, he's a very clever guy, he would want to be able to earn a living and give a talk about the subject. And over 70 years of his, you know, he died at 95, over 70 years of his life, he said, you end up having a lot of knowledge. And creativity is drawing on unrelated sets of knowledge that suddenly are useful. The most boring people I know are the ones who don't study anything. They're not curious. They're just doing. And that's why I wrote that poem, Some Think and Some Do. If you only do, you will intellectually become rigid. And I've met 25-year-olds with minds like concrete, and I've met 80-year-olds with minds that are just agile and open and are thinking. So, so reflect on that a bit. Education will definitely change. It always has changed. It's just we were locked into a particular mode of education. I was just talking to the Dean of Gibbs before the call, and we now have over 25 online only courses. And we all teaching the MBA online. And there's some power in this medium. There's a lot missing from it, but anyone can watch uh, this session anywhere in the world if you make it available. That has never, ever happened before. A kid in Bangladesh can listen to a professor at MIT. Unbelievable. And you can plug in any subject on the web. I had to plug in how to uh, update my electric uh, meter in my apartment because I've not had a prepaid meter before. It took me 30 seconds on the internet. All the information of the knowledge is available for almost zero cost. It's just more about you focusing on what's the problem you're trying to solve. That's what education is. Education is preparing you to do things. So how, if, if we have so much available to us, we could spend our entire lives just learning and not doing, or just thinking, do thinking we're learning, but we're just consuming time. How do we know, or how do we do it strategically that we focused on something that is gonna help? Because if I spend my time, as you said, learning flower arranging, I, I think I've gone mad, or at least my Good. wife. Is, and I'm gone. telling you to go mad. I'm encouraging you to do that. Let me say, most of your learning should be about what you need to know, but some of it must be random. You know, I'm I'm not a physics guy, but occasionally I'll read an article about you know that's related to physics, just mm. to stimulate the brain. The brain is the most incredible thing imaginable. It can it can think about anything. It's the most, it's flexible. Go to subjects you don't like and you'll start to develop some insights. Most of us want to stay with what we know. We want to keep talking to the same friends. You don't learn any, much talking to your chummies. You, you have chumminess with them. But if you want to learn something, find the person you know the least and go and talk to them. You'll learn much more. I learn about South Africa when I'm not here. I learn much more about South Africa when I'm not here because I'm looking at something else. Let, let me show it to you this simply. Hmm. If you are A and you've only know A, you don't know what A is until you meet B. Think about that. And when you meet C and D and E, then you know what A is. But until you meet B, you don't even know what A is. So I encourage you to a quarter of your learning time make kind of random. David, you were saying I can't fly anymore, so I drive. I've made four trips Joburg to Cape Town. I never go on the national roads. I've gone on four totally different trips, west of Joburg, down the west coast, to the Namibian border, all the way down the west coast, then to Uppington and Diagonal, then to the Eastern Cape, and then through Pongola along the coast to Cape Town. I got a sense of the country. 
and I go to small towns and I go drive in the township and I drive through the main street and I go and get a drink and within half an hour, you've got a feel of the town. So go. Fantastic. And go to Asia. Don't go back to London. London is so boring. We all know London. The, the world, go to Asia, go to China, go to India, go to Vietnam, the Philippines. Then you'll get creative. You want to see entrepreneurship today, go to Asia. So, so Nick, then how do you fit it in? Like you were talking about the roadmap to start with. And so you want to go to Marrakesh. So you've got to start planning your route very carefully. Yeah. But now you're saying you've got this route to go to Marrakesh, but you just take a random off ramp somewhere. Absolutely. Uh, so maybe so plan, in the wrong direction. I, you know, I hate um, budgets. I lived under the tyranny of budgets, but we all have to have a budget. I hate planning that much, too much, but we all have to have a plan. I always have a plan. When COVID came, I got miserable for a couple of months because my life was totally changed. I developed a three-year plan. I was just about to start making a movie about the country, driving around. I had to throw all that away. I got to lockdown and uh, I had to redo my entire plan. And now I'm in that plan, how to live with COVID. Um, that's what I'm doing. Some of it imposed on me, some of it I've chosen to do. So you always have options, but you must always have a plan. So even if, even if your plan changes, you need obviously some direction. If reality changes, you must change your strategy. Mm. Look at restaurants. Which restaurants will survive this? The ones who built delis, the ones who built takeout and did it aggressively. The ones who reinvented their menu, the ones who changed their pricing structure. It's always about adaptation. So, Nick, just looking at you in, in your uh, on, on the screen, I can see your adaptation to, very clearly to the way the world has changed. So you've got your whiteboard where you're busy doing your training. You've got your Wi-Fi so that you can connect. And very importantly, I see you've got your bottle of wine behind you as well. Dessert wine. <laughs> and you can't hear, but I've got a bit of classical music playing in the background. <laughs> and the company of you guys. Well, that's fantastic. So, so David, um, let me talk a bit about where we are and the country, if that's okay with you. I would like that. And, then, and also, on top of that, if you can then give the advice to the 20, 40, and 60-year-old. I can't do that. But, but let me just end the strategy piece by just saying two things to you. There are four things, there are four pots you have to master. The first is the market. Let's call it the environment. It's the market, the industry, and the economy. Three layers of the onion. It's the outside. It does need your permission to change. It's the source of all your resources. Your understanding of it is central. So that's the E. The second is the S. The S is for strategy. Strategy is what will we do next? What are we going to do with the word do underlined? It's like chess. You have to make a move. What's your move? It's like uh, online gaming, the speed of online gaming. I love online gaming because it's so fast. The U.S. military use it to teach their officers decision making. Much faster than chess much more open-ended than chess. But chess is a very good game. It was developed to teach leaders to fight, to, to develop tactics. So the second is strategy. How will you compete? What will you do next? What choices do you have? The third is O for organization. A good idea means absolutely bugger all unless you can organize. And organization may be systems, maybe structure, maybe processes, it may be the culture of the business, which for a young entrepreneur you establish through your behavior. But you must design the vehicle. And you must be constantly asking yourself, is the design of this vehicle right for the road I'm on? And if it's not, you should change it. Most entrepreneurs work harder and harder and don't spend enough time on the organization itself the measurement, the systems, the, the, all the organizational disciplines. 
And the last is, is personal, is leadership. Be a good manager, be a good leader, be a good entrepreneur, be a good innovator. Those are the four parts I just wanted to end that. And then the last thing I want to say about strategy is a simple quote. And I'm sorry that I don't have it on a slide for you, but I'm going to repeat it. What can this business do that the world wants or will want it to do that its rivals can't do? Write that down and test that on yourself. What can this organization do that the world wants or will want it to do that its rivals can't do? And in those 15 words, you've got the heart of strategy. So use it. What can this organization do that the world wants or will want it to do that its rivals can't do? And if you can answer that persuasively to yourself and others, you have a strategy. So isn't, it arrogant, isn't it arrogant to think that others can't do it, that you can do, find something that others can't do? You might find things that others can't do. Look at Musk. Hmm. Yeah. Every, every soccer match, that's what it is. What can Arsenal do that Liverpool can't do will determine the winner. How A meets B, both have a plan. What they have to do is to learn to play that game. And in that lies what they can't do. Hmm. Are, are they not fast enough? Are they too expensive? Have they got the wrong products? Have they got the wrong culture? You've got to search for advantage. Life is the search for advantage. Not only is life the search for advantage, but a big part of life is the search for advantage. Wow. The world doesn't know you're living. And I go to Lagos. Lagos is the most energetic city I've ever been to in the world. More energetic than Shanghai or London or New York because there are 20 million people with no government services and no infrastructure. They are the most energetic. To survive in Lagos, you have to know what you're doing. And so that's what it is. You have to survive. You have to compete every day in Lagos. We're quite a lazy country. We're quite a lucky country. We don't have that work rate. When I go to Asia, I'm stunned by how hard people work. We work eight hours a day in companies and think that's legitimate. Some of them only work six or five. Hmm. In COVID, people are maybe even working less. Right, so, so let me stop there. I find it interesting that you went through that acronym of the ESOL, and that's a way to win. But if you spell it backwards, it actually spells lose. I don't know if <laughs> go the right way. Start go the right the way. <laughs> and I think even that, there's a message in that, that oh. maybe you go the route that you think will lose and you win if you go the other way. So you put and that, yourself as the center of the universe, you're going to lose. Yeah. Yeah. But you and must have maybe, the self, you maybe must if, have self belief. Yeah. And if you come to a roadblock, you've got to go the other way, and then it's not a one way street anymore. I find that fascinating. So I'm, I'm going to come back to that question, but I want to change it slightly. The, what, the advice to a 20-year-old, 40-year-old, and 6-year-old and ask you, is it different advice? Is there different advice that you give at these different stages? Or, or is it the message that you've been given, giving us all along? Is it the same message regardless of where you're at? It's, well, is it well the, answer, you sounds like, the answer sounds like an economist. Yeah. <laughs> On the one hand and the other hand. Uh, Nick, are you there? I think. I think when he said it's the answer sounds like an economist. Economist the answer. Sorry, Nick, we, we we lost you for a few seconds there. You said the answer sounds like an economist, and then you were quiet. So sorry about that. I'm not sure why. <laughs> oh, I see my. Let me just uh, double check my connectivity. Oh, I can see what happened. Just hold on. Just give me a minute. I thought the economist just doesn't answer. I thought that was your your answer. Was it? I know the economists they always say on the one hand and on the other hand. So, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Yeah, I've got some or other problem with my connection here.
I see Nick is frozen again. So while we're waiting for, for Nick to come back, I'll share a little story about two economists that go hunting. And they're walking along and they see a duck flying in the sky. And the one economist pulls out his gun and he shoots. And the feathers on top of the duck just ruffle a bit. And then the next economist gets up and he fires his gun and there are feathers underneath the duck just ruffle a bit. And these economists jump and hug each other and give each other high fives. And the guide who's with them looks at them and thinks, well, these guys are mad. This duck's still flying in the sky. And he goes to them, he said, why are you giving each other high fives? This duck's still flying. And the economists say, no, but on average, we killed the duck. <laughs> and I think the story of that is just the doing and the planning and the thinking. You can't think about doing something if you're not getting the results, you're not getting the results. And you need to change the way that you think about things, as Nick says. So I can see Nick has just dropped off the call, unfortunately. Uh, so I'm going to open it up. Any questions that when he comes back, you want me to answer, if you can... Uh, maybe just unmute yourself or or anything that you want to repeat that he said that spoke specifically to any of you. Is there anyone who wants to jump in and ask something or add if this has added any value to you in in what way has this added value to you? Maybe while we're thinking of the Tracy, maybe what we can do is while we're waiting, I was going to say, let's go for a commercial break. And the commercial break <laughs> is that Ort, Ort, uh, is, a, is runs by donations. And maybe, Tracy, if you can put the poll up of anybody who's here, I would like to donate uh, something to Ort so they can continue with the operation. So uh, Tracy's put the poll up. There's a donation appeal. Would you like to make a donation? And you can choose any one of those amounts or any other amount that you'd like to. Thank you, David. And I would just um, like to say with regards to the donation, you know, we find ourselves in the times where um, the assistance that we provide to small businesses is really life-changing. Nick spoke about so many things um, that, that we are working on already and that we provide our businesses um, on the program. So any donation would be kindly appreciated. I also see that Frank has joined us and Frank, um, I'm so pleased to see you online because you give time to all the businesses every single week um, to strategize and to help them on the way forward. So, so thank you, Frank. But Nick is back online now, um, so I'm happy to continue. Right. I'm sorry about that, guys. Um, David, just rewind the tape for me. I'm not sure where you lost me. I, I know you repeated it. It'll help me. Okay. So we, uh, we were talking about uh, taking the off-ramps. <laughs> I was uh, – and then you took the off-ramp. It's just my, – my question was – the advice that you give, is it different no. for a 20-year-old, no. 40-year-old, 60-year-old? Or no. is it the same advice and it's more dependent on the environment you're in than the age that you actually are at? No, that's a, that, that's a very good question. And, and what I was trying to say is that uh, the answer is like an economist, and that's what I heard you talking about, is, is yes and no. These are universal principles, so they can apply at any age. I always marvel at how agile Madiba was at 75. Um, so it's not about age. It's about your state of mind, I think, and the point you bring in, the kind of environment you're in. If you're in, in a, let's take an ad agency. Uh, ad agencies are intensely creative institutions and you, you know, most people peak in their thirties, um, you know, like traders do, uh, you just burn out, I think. so. It depends on the environment and miners are very slow and steady and rational it really depends on the environment but there is a difference that i want to talk about in these age categories 
because it's, I've, I've never been asked this question before and it's an interesting question. So I suppose the first question is, if you take 40 as the midpoint, and you say, generally speaking, because of course there are many exceptions, what's a 40 year old look like? Well, a 40 year old still has these days 20 or 30 years of work ahead, but they've accumulated already at least 20 years of, of working life experience that matters. So they're in the midpoint. And what I would say is, the questions I'm raising are posed and poised for them because they've had enough experience to know what they're doing. And a lot of what we learn, we learn intuitively. they rules of thumb, we accumulate how we behave, you know, how we make decisions, how we relate to people. We pretty mature at 40. Um, and, and the 40 to 60 is this incredible period where you should really blossom to your full potential. And of course, now 60 is the new 70. So, you know, I'm still going strong. If you then rewind it to 20 and you say, well, what should a 40 year old say to a 20 year old? What a 20 year old has that a 40 year old doesn't and a 60 year old struggles to have is a blank sheet of paper. And a, a 20 year old brings innocence and naivety to the issues. And so what 20 year olds have to do is borrow from the 40 year olds. And what the 40 year olds want to do is borrow from the 20 year olds. To give you an example, so um, I grew up in Cape Town and I've just moved here and I've got family and I've got Joburg chommies and I've got some old Cape Town chommies because I haven't lived here for 40 years. And then I've made a lot of friends. And a lot of my friends are young. They are under 30 and they've got very young kids. And I don't have grandkids, my, my, my daughter's in, in the UK. And there's something incredible that happens when you talk to a different generation, they're 30 year olds, and then you meet their young kids. And so what I'm saying is each generation has a different dynamic and each have big gifts to give each other. I mean, a six year old has a huge amount of wisdom to share if they're smart and they're good teachers and they, committed and they've led a, a good life. So each has, they're in different places, I think, but the principles are the same. And for the 20 year old, it's the act of discovery. And uh, you know, that's what that age is. The age of the twenties is still more education and more discovery and the early part of Campbell's journey, taking the adventure and going on the journey. In your 40s, you've got a lot of responsibilities. And so you don't have the same freedoms probably, but now you've had 20 years of experience, but you still are running at a hell of a pace. Um, by the time you're 60, you have placed yourself on the map. I mean, some people like a Mandela can come out of jail and run a country. Most of us couldn't do that. What we know at 60 is what we know we can't transfer it to something totally the opposite, most of us. But we have a lot of scars. I once read a lovely poem that said, people who are older have scars that shine, which I like. That's fantastic. Um, okay, Nick, so as we starting to wind up, if there's anyone who's got any questions, you can unmute and ask the questions. Um, I just want to ask you, before we end off, is going forward and, and with the world that has changed and COVID, what's, what's the, the key thing that we should learn from what we, I was going to say, have been through, but what we're actually still going through? Is there a key lesson that we should either learn or look out for? Beautiful. So the starting point is, to some degree or another, nothing is the same. So my father um, left school in Senate 8 because of the depression. He was one of 10 children. He had to support the family. He went through the depression and the Second World War, and it shaped the rest of his life. But my father, when he was 92, you know, was curious about the Internet. So this open-mindedness is, is absolutely key. But the world is not the same, and it's never going to be the same. And, and, and COVID is just a little bump, it's a little peak, it's a little spike. 
But if you look at human life and how it's changed in our lifetimes, it's almost unimaginable. Let me share this with you. When I was born, there were two and a half billion. There are now eight billion of us. When I was born, life expectancy, we lived 30 years longer than our grandparents all over the world. 30 years longer, on average, if you put the whole world's population together. We've lifted 2 billion people out of poverty in 30 years. These are miraculous, what the digital economy has done to us, what globalization has done to us. And there are all sorts of toxic side effects like social media, but there's such massive positives. So uh, let, me, let me share that with you is our, our, the core of this thing is to unlearn. More important than learning. Let me, let me put it in a sentence. How you've got in the room and what you're doing in the room is not how you're going to get out of the room. I'll give you a trivial example. When I was a little boy, I used to, we lived in Kenya and I used to love reading the paper. I was sort of 10, 11, and my dad would make the paper like a tent at the breakfast table. So I had to learn to read upside down. <laughs> he used to read the paper like a tent. And I've always had this curiosity for newspapers. And then when I was about 16 or so, I started reading when he'd finished with the paper, so I'd try to read it, but I could never fold the pages. You know, with a big double page spread, you stuff it up, you crunch it up. And he used to get irritated with me because I'd make a mess of the paper. I can now do this like ballet. I have opened double page spread Sunday crimes for 40 years of my life. I never make a mistake. It's just deeply buried like driving in my routines. But I no longer read newspapers because all of my information comes to the internet. Some habits I haven't changed. I like physical books. I indulge myself, I still buy them. Yes, I do a few audibles, but by and large, I still have physical books. Yeah. So some so of my habits... I want to stop you there because I want to no. share a story with the audience. And I'm sure you know the story <laughs> I'm going to share with the audience. Is many years ago, uh, 20 odd years ago, I was walking down the beach in Gordon's Bay and in the distance, I saw some, somebody sitting on a chair in an umbrella on the beach. And I've only ever seen somebody sitting on the beach with one book before, but there was somebody sitting with a pile of must have been 10 books next to him on the beach. And it was you. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. My, my, my daughter, um, I asked my daughter last week what she's reading. She's a reader, which is unusual for a 26 year old. And she told me and said, what are you reading? I said, Jordan, I'm reading too many books. I can't tell you. I think I'm reading 10 books at once, I said. And then I, I spoke to her and I said, it's actually 26. And I could send you a picture. I laid them on the floor. Um, I'm, I'm an avarice. I, I'm a, I'm a, I read everything. And what happens is somehow they fit together. I just finished a book about a ship, an American ship that sank uh, about 15 years ago. And it's a, I'm writing it as a case study because it's the story of South Africa, of the things that went wrong are all in the story about a ship. Who would have thought reading a book about a ship I would find so useful to teach? So be eclectic about your reading and be eclectic about your relationships. Don't keep talking to the same people. They'll yeah. tell you the same things. Journey out and take a risk and go to the places and the people you know the least. I'll give you a silly example. When I was a kid, I was a very avid table tennis player, competitive table tennis, and I stopped playing. And I've started again, and I now play in Salt River in the community hall which is dedicated to the struggle and all the heroes, the Ashley Creel Hall. And I play with all with colored guys. Some of them have their own teeth, most not. And they're <laughs> wonderful, wonderful guys. They're brilliant table tennis players. Two are national champions, have been national champions. And they are just full of warmth and life and humor. And they speak a language I can barely follow. And I find that South Africa. South Africa are these pockets of incredible people. Don't drive the same route to work. 
Don't keep talking to the same people about the same thing. If you find yourself having the fifth conversation about a subject, change the conversation because the world is so interesting. There's so much variety. There's so much to learn. And I think all of us in that sense should be scholars. I don't mean academics. I mean scholars, curiosity. So let me uh, leave that to the so Nick, you're, you're saying that the world has changed so much and it's not just now with COVID. It reminds me of something my father used to say that um, he said when his father was born, there was no motor car. By the time his father died, man had walked on the moon. And exactly. I think that, that kind of puts it into perspective. But, but David, it's much worse than that. Hmm. It's much worse than that. I mean, if you think of the last five years or the last 10 years, you know, I don't know how old your dad was, but you talk about 100 years. My dad lived 90. I'm talking of the last 10 years. Yeah. The world is not just not the same. And you either get depressed. A lot of people who are older get depressed by that. And I'm finding myself dysfunctional. I don't know how to do things. On tech, I have to have a 20-year-old. I just can't do certain things. I'm learning, but I know that's what I've got to know. And that's all you've got to know. You, all you've got to know is you've got to know what you've got to know. And then you'll find a way to learn it. And that's why I think life and, and being South African at this time is so challenging because we are in such trouble. And yet here we lead a full life. If I compare it to, I talked to my sister in Australia yesterday. <laughs> so funny. In Australia, you know, there's no news in Australia. So they've got this lockdown and they've had a terrible surge and 20 people have COVID. It's like, what? <laughs> I always say, you know, compared to my mates in London, if I get home safely in Joburg and I got home safely, that's the good news for the day. You know, they, they, it, we live in this tumult, in this transformation, in this unknown. What happened in KZN has threatened us. It's shaken us. The images of KZN were the images of the 80s, and it sunk into our minds because we, if you're old enough, know what that was. And so what are we going to do about it? Some think, and some do, and some do both, very few, is do something about the situation. Do what you guys are doing. Give away. Be generous. Lift up as we rise. There are 20 million South Africans who are trapped in a life of human indignity. We have no future if we don't lift them up. And I know that's your values. It's why I always enjoy working with you guys. You are givers. Fantastic. And I think this fits into your other quote as well, which you said, and maybe you use the word growth, but maybe it's positive change. Growth is the oxygen of life. If we don't have growth, we'll never take a risk. Growth is a fuel and adrenaline of life. And I think your talk today and everything you've shared with us hope has helped us grow and has given us that oxygen that we actually know how important it is even more than we did before having going through the COVID times. Nick, it's, it's always an absolute pleasure chatting to you. And as, it's amazing how you put the different perspectives on it from the map and the mirror and the different routes and your acronym of ESOL, etc. I just, uh, I could listen to you forever and I hope I get another opportunity to, to chat to you and to share it with everybody else. But uh, it's just, uh, just want to thank you for your time. I know you're very good at doing all that and, and to share it so generously with us. So I must you tell you that... Yes. Two of the story of Gordon's Bay when you found me on the beach. Yes. Describing at all these books. And it's true. I'd gone there. I was starting a journey and I'd gone there and I decided to stop because I went there as a kid and I hadn't been for years. After I saw you, because I remember seeing you there. After I saw you, I got a phone call out of the blue from the wife of my closest colleague at Gibbs, who'd left at about four in the morning to drive back to Joburg and fell asleep at the wheel of his car and rolled his car near Lanesburg with three passengers in, and they rolled over into the felt. They all got thrown out the car, and I got a phone call from his wife. 
<laughs> You'll love the story. His wife said, I'm just calling to let you know Carl won't be at work on Monday. I said, oh, why is that? He said, because he's had a crash in Lanesburg. I said, is he all right? He says, well, they're at the hospital. I think they're all okay. They're just getting checked out. So I packed my books into my bag, folded my camp chair, got into my car and drove to Lanesburg. <laughs> so <laughs> instead of reading books, I was going to sort out my very close chummy. And that's exactly what life's about. Yeah. It's what happens, what you don't expect. None of us would want to live in COVID times. Nobody I know. But all of us have to find a way to live in COVID times. And we either suck the marrow out of life or we have carpe diem and we seize the day or we sort of wither away and become bitter uh, people complaining you know, complaining about them. The biggest tribe in South Africa is them. It's anyone who's not like you is them. They are the problem instead of realizing we're the answer. So thank you for inviting me. And I hope some of you found a few of the thoughts I've shared of some value to you. And good luck to you and Orchet. You do amazing work. Right. Thank you, Nick. So, and thank you. So I'd like to thank David for an outstanding in the boardroom facilitation. All the AutoJet in the boardroom sessions are facilitated by David. We're so grateful for his time. And Nick, thank you so much. I know this was booked months and months ago. I know your schedule is chaotic. And I just thank you for sharing such nuggets of wisdom with regards to strategy, to life to surrounding yourself with eclectic people um, to where the world is and where the world is going. It is an absolute honor always to spend time in your company. And we are so grateful that you have um, supported the Orchard program for so many years. And we sincerely look forward to working with you again soon. Thank Great you. Pleasure. Good luck, everybody. Thank you, Thank David. You.